by congressional subpoenas on the January 6th committee. I hope that the committee goes after them and uh, holds them accountable. Should they be prosecuted by the I, Justice I do, Department? yes. President Biden suggesting the Justice Department should prosecute Trump allies who refuse subpoenas from the House's January 6th committee. Let's talk about that and more on the roundtable with our ABC News team, Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl, also a co-anchor of This Week, Weekend White House Correspondent Mary Alice Parks, Political Director Rick Klein, and ABC Correspondent Stephanie Ramos. Welcome to all of you. And John, I, I want to talk to you first. We have this massive supply chain that we've been talking about this morning going into the holidays, inflation up 5.4 percent over the past year. How much of a political problem is this for President Biden? Well, empty store shelves, uh, people unable to buy Christmas presents. That's not a good thing for the president, to say the least. But I think the biggest concern here is, does this lead to even more inflation? You know, Martha, one of the numbers I saw, sets of numbers I saw this week that really uh, hit home on this is the cost of, of shipping a container from China. Uh, if you go back to 2019, pre-pandemic, it was about $1,300. Now, $16,000 to bring a container from China. That ripples through uh, the, the, the supply chain. It makes things, it's going to make things more expensive. High inflation. And look, the biggest factor here, the single biggest factor, is that people are buying more stuff. Uh, so there's an underlying bit of good news here. Uh, people have the means and desire to buy more things. The problem is uh, the supply chain has not caught up. And, and the White House did announce this 24-7. Actually, some of them were already doing that. I saw that there in the ports. But you can't really do that if you don't have enough workers. Did the White House move quickly enough on this, Mary Alice? Yeah, they want to show that they're on it. They're getting private companies together. But unless they take extreme measures, I mean, unless all of a sudden we're talking about the National Guard unloading container ships, we're really talking about the White House putting public pressure on private companies. And in that way, getting involved is sort of the catch-22. They had to do it early. They have to show that they're paying attention. But at some point now, they own this because he's been involved. And that's risky because... Like I said, there's not actually that much the White House can do day to day except continue to put pressure on these private companies. And then keep going out and talking about it and saying it's under control. Right. And speaking of that, Stephanie, the Treasury Secretary said she thinks the prices will go down soon and there's no need to panic. That's not what I heard out there. That's not what I'm hear hearing across the country. But we're, we're talking about medical supplies. We're talking be beyond the economy. We're talking about military families who can't get their furniture and household goods back from deployments in Asia. This is really hitting the American public. It really is. And American families, they're the ones that are feeling this. And it's hard when you're in it to be in the mind frame of in the next six months, we'll, we'll, we'll get away from this and things will be better. They are in it right now and trying to survive so that when they are going to the grocery store and seeing these increased prices, where where is the comfort? Where are the tools to help them? But the Treasury Secretary is saying this is transitory, but also saying that this isn't going away in the next month or so. And I spoke with the Deputy uh, Secretary a few days ago, and I asked him, was there anything the Biden administration could have done to prevent this, to get ahead of this, to prepare for this? And he didn't exactly answer that, but did say that this was expected, that the economy just hasn't transitioned with us out of this pandemic. And and, and says it's going to take time. He says the president, of course, is focused on these issues. He touted the American Rescue Plan, the emergency impact payments, the child tax credit, and says it is going to take a while for the supply chain to catch up with the demand. And, and meanwhile, there is going to be panic buying. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. about that, I think. When you say don't panic, people tend to exactly. panic. Exactly. Right. Don't work. panic, but make sure your shelves are yeah. stocked. And when you start talking about scream, Christmas. Yes. And order now. Panic. Yeah, <laughs> and Christmas and your children, and you, you definitely want to do that. And Rick, we're still more than a year out, however, <clears throat> from the midterms, but the economy is clearly becoming a huge issue, and the Republicans already taking advantage of that, doubling down on this. Yeah, think about it. The election's about pocketbook issues. If your pocketbook feels that much lighter because you can't afford things. And Republicans see now an emerging set of issues like inflation, like rising gas prices, like rising crime rates, uh, and of course the fact that the pandemic is still ongoing. And they say this is a, a brew of issues that they can make into something against Democrats. They say, look, they promised
promised that they would bring some stability, but there hasn't been that kind of stability in your life across this range of issues. And this inflation thing in particular is problematic on another level because guess who keeps talking about inflation as a concern? As, as Democrats debate these bills, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, the, one of the big holdouts on this, he's worried about the idea of pumping even more trillions of dollars into an economy that might already be overheated with excessive demand. And, and he's worried about a lot of things. <laughs> uh, and, and John, of course, on Capitol Hill, we have the infrastructure, the spending bill. What's the progress on that? We know Nancy Pelosi has now set a deadline. Uh, yeah, month. Halloween. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think that deadline is yeah. going to be, be met. But Steny Hoyer, who runs the, the, the floor schedule, says there will be votes uh, coming up on both the infrastructure bill and this larger social infrastructure bill. But it's, it's not looking good. You saw Bernie Sanders, uh, who, of course, has been leading the charge for a big uh, social infrastructure bill, the budget chairman. He actually wrote an op-ed in one of the West Virginia papers going right at Joe Manchin, saying that by standing in the way, Joe Manchin is hurting West Virginians. And Joe Manchin responded with a blistering statement. I mean, Martha, I want to just read a, a sentence from this. I will not vote for a reckless expansion of government programs. No op-ed from a self-declared independent socialist is going to change that. So it doesn't look like Bernie Sanders' efforts to pressure uh, Joe Manchin have gotten him any closer to voting for this. And remember, they can't do it without him. No, they can't do that. And, and, and Stephanie, we saw this week at the, at the, uh, Connecticut, in Connecticut on Friday the president trying to sell his agenda. And he said they might have to cut out made some implication that they might have to cut out community college, that for, for all. And Joe Manchin is against a lot of these climate controls. He absolutely is. And, and that's right, we heard President Biden, and we've heard a lot of this from him on the campaign trail and in office. He's proposed the two years of free, uh, tuition-free community college. And it was... It was kind of stunning to hear him doubt that that could make it into this final version of the package or that it would need to be adjusted in some way. Uh, but at this point, it's on the chopping block. And uh, when you hear Joe Manchin come out against some of these programs, it's troubling because the administration and Democrats need all the Democratic support that they can get. And Manchin, of course, against the, the clean electricity program. He's uh, in West Virginia. He's in West Virginia. And, you know, the White House has said that they are sticking with their plan. This is part of the president's big uh, plan to battle climate change. But we'll have to see in the next few days if if that uh, if that happens, if they stick with their plan, because, of course, they're trying to get this package over the line. And, and Mary Alice, many of the workers going on strike around the country, we've seen a lot of those um, suggestions of strikes pushing for benefits that Democrats want mm -hmm. in the spending bill. Are they capitalizing on this? Uh, Senator Sanders is trying to. His team told me that he sent pizzas to the to those on the picket lines with John Deere, um, that, that the senator was on the phone with one of the strike leaders there uh, with the John Deere workers. Uh, but they, you know, to your point, they, they know that those that are on the picket lines are making some of their arguments for them. They're not only asking for more pay, they're asking for more benefits, things like paid medical leave. Progressives say, great, that's in the bill. They're asking for things like pensions and help with child care, you know, some of those issues that are keeping people out of the labor force right now. And Democrats are saying we're trying to address that in the bill. But to John's point about the deadline, I mean, the Sanders folks kind of laughed at the idea of meeting that that October 31st deadline. I talked to a former Manchin staffer who said that that deadline was laughable. They've known for a long time that those climate provisions are the crux of what has these two sides colliding. And they have to come to the around, sit around a table together and actually just hash this out. But it seems right now they're still just too far apart to do that. Okay, John, your prediction, how long does this go? What happens? I know well, you don't like to predict, <laughs> but... I don't like predictions, especially about the yes, future. Yes. But, um, <laughs> um, but, but, but look, I, I, I think that uh, there's a recognition among Democrats that failure on both of these is truly not an option. There's more, there's actually more at stake than even the fundamentals of what are in these bills. It's really the success or failure of the Biden presidency. Uh, that said, how you actually cobble this together is unclear. You know, with, with uh, House Democrats signaling there will be votes on both of these bills. And it wasn't like a, unless the Senate's, you know, done everything on the, on the social infrastructure bill. No, there will be votes on these bills. So it seems to me that they will at least get one of these across the line. Not, by, not necessarily by Halloween, but they will get at least one of these across the line. So, so much attention on this in Washington. But, Rick, I, I was 
Stunned by the CNN poll, let me read it. Only a quarter of Americans think their lives will be better off if both the infrastructure and social spending bills pass. More than four in 10 said they wouldn't make a difference and about a third said they'd be worse off. It, it really does seem like whatever they're doing on the Hill, the Democrats aren't selling it to the Americans. A people. massive failure to communicate what's in the bill, in part because they don't actually know what's in the bill. Mm -hmm. Well, how can you sell this? But think about that. They are talking about the largest expansion in, in social service uh, spending in, in American history, and only one fourth of people think it's actually better for them. This, to me, has real shades of the health care debate from more than a decade ago. I've talked to a number of Democrats who've made the point that they failed throughout that to communicate what the stakes were. They got bogged down in the process. And by the time they got over the finish line, it was defined politically. And the idea that even if you pass this now, that you can then go out and make the case that this works for people, they're betting so many of their midterm hopes on that and recovery from COVID, things that ultimately may be out of their control because perceptions have gotten away from them. This is a, this is a big problem that Democrats are worried about, that even if they get it done, they're not going to be able to, to make much of it. Mm -hmm. and, and John, I want to move to January 6th. We yeah. saw that at the, at the top of the show there. The select committee investigating the attack on the Capitol moved to hold former Trump advisor Steve Bannon in criminal contempt for refusing to comply with the subpoena. You write about this in your upcoming book next month that we're all looking forward to. But what happens now with these subpoenas? Well, the Bannon subpoena and, the, and the, bat, the Bannon fight is about much more than just Steve Bannon because the committee wants to talk to everybody that was around Donald Trump on January 6th. And this is the test case. Can they compel Steve Bannon to testify? Martha, Congress doesn't have its own prosecutors. Congress doesn't have its own jail cells. Uh, Congress has very little or if in fact, really no ability to actually enforce these subpoenas. That's why what you heard from Biden was so significant. He is saying that he wants to see the Justice Department, which is which does have the power to enforce this, but has not in the past uh, come in and prosecute Steve Bannon. Now, the Justice Department quickly put out a statement making it clear this is not the president's call. It's an independent Justice Department that will make the decision on prosecuting. But it sure looks like they will prosecute uh, Bannon. It's a lengthy process. This will be a big uh, court fight. And the question is, can they get all this done in time to actually matter for their investigation? And, and Mary Alice, the president also rejected former President Trump's executive privilege came instru uh, claim instructing the National Archives to comply with the committee's documents. But Trump is almost certainly going to fight this. Right. That's the expectation is that the Trump team does, in fact, sue. But I think it's important to note that they haven't yet. So we're kind of all bracing for this legal showdown, but we'll see what that lawsuit actually looks like. There's a lot of legal scholars that say the former president doesn't have a great case. This hasn't been tested in the courts yet. Uh, Steve Bannon probably has an even weaker case. Right. How do you say that you have an executive privilege claim when you didn't work in the White House for several years before? Uh, but you're exactly right. The White House has been totally on board with helping this committee. They have said that they want everyone to cooperate. In fact, the White House counsel said that they wanted the National Archives to, to give over those documents within 30 days, absent any court order. And, and Stephanie, there's also a new charge of uh, uh, the January 6th insurrection, an actual Capitol police officer. Tell us about that. It really does tell you we don't know all of what happened up there. If we're still learning these things, they're still making arrests. Exactly. So many months later, and it really shows you that authorities have not stopped trying to track down the individuals that took part in the January 6th riot, even 10 months or so later. Now you have this Capitol Police officer who has a, a whole lot of questions to answer as he faces obstruction charges. He was there that day responding to the scene, but then the very next day was trying to help one of the insurrectionists by, by telling him to take down some of the Facebook uh, messages and uh, or through Facebook telling telling him to take down some posts showing that that person was there trying to protect them and saying, hey, I'm looking out for you. But this is just one of about 600 or so Capitol riot cases. And it's an unusual one because it involves a Capitol police officer. So he is on paid administrative leave. He has not entered a plea, uh, but it really just goes to show you that so many months later, authorities are trying to figure out who these individuals are that tried to get into the Capitol and then who was inside and, and, and tried to help them. And, and Rick, very quickly, we have about 30 seconds left. There was a, a rally in Virginia, the gubernatorial race there, and they were actually taking a pledge of allegiance to one of the flags carried right before the insurrection. 
Yeah, it's absolutely stunning, and it plays right into Democrats' hands, frankly, because their argument uh, for the midterms and for the, the gubernatorial race in a few weeks is, remember January 6th, remember what President Trump did, remember what those Trump years were like, including the messy end, and as much as Republicans try to distance themselves from it, this is going on inside their base, and this is a real thing that, that you're going to continue to see play out as far as Democrats go. And they really will have to continue to see that. Thanks so very much to all of you this morning. Always great to have you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.